Amen. Well, hey, thanks for hanging with us today. Pastor Joe Ann is on stage in the house. And uh, this is going to kick off. We're going to kick off our series today on um, uh, marriage and relationship and intimacy. Parents, if you got little ones in the room, take advantage of the kids' ministry. Yes. Take advantage of our teen ministry, kids' nursery. Uh, if you want to leave them in here, that's totally up to you, but we are I told you, we're going to talk about it. So, amen. So, take advantage of all those ministries. But I want to encourage you guys to take notes today. And uh, let me say, too, Pastor Dan and I are going to share... And we don't know everything. Uh, this is a combination of what we've learned, what we've experienced, what we have read, what's been taught to us um, over our um, 17 mm -hmm. years of marriage. Almost 18. Almost eight, 18 in October. Right. Se 17 years. Come on, amen about that. <laughs> 17 years. I feel like I'm far away. We're not getting... What's wrong? What happened? I don't like these stools. I know, but I don't... <laughs> I mean, I'm limited with furniture right now, <laughs> this moment. Um, we need uh, to, like, go and sit in each stool, pick out which one we like. We could do that. That's an option. <laughs> um, so 17 years of uh, marriage, and, uh, you know, I told her if she leaves me, I'm going with her. So we're <laughs> kind of stuck with me, right? Well, you have me stuck with eight kids. You're stuck. Nobody's going to want to be with me. Nobody's going to want you with eight kids. You did that on purpose. I don't even have to try as hard now, really, because no. nobody's, I'm just. You did that on purpose. Actually, she left me and married some. I could never afford the child support. I'd have to move in with you and him just to make it. <laughs> I'd have to live with you guys. I could never afford all the child support. So eight kids. But uh, we just want to say that, um, please, in, in this series, uh, please don't go to your spouse and say, hey, let's be like them. We don't have it all together. No, we, we have don't. challenges and difficulties. God's still working on her. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm just kidding. He's working on me. But God's working on us. You don't have to say anything. They know. They know. I know. <laughs> but, but God's working on us. And, uh, you know, the only, the only people you need to compare yourself to is who you used to be. Yes. Amen. Come on. And so just look to Jesus. And, and uh, this is meant to encourage you, to challenge you, to stir you, to convict you, but not to condemn you. And so uh, the Bible says there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so let that be an encouragement. But I want you, if you have your Bibles, to go with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 7. And, you know, let me just start off by saying uh, marriage is not about a contract. Marriage is about a covenant. It's a covenant. It's, it's about two becoming one. And when two become one, they don't become one like this where you can see two. They become one like this where you can't even tell that there's two. And so um, it's not about a contract. And, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to divorce, uh, you know, we live in a world that says, oh, you can just get, you know, if you don't like it, uh, you don't like him anymore, she doesn't like um, him and he doesn't like her, you know, or you're not happy. I don't know who promised you happiness. No, it doesn't say anywhere in your marriage vows. I don't remember ever that happiness was marrying anybody. Happen. I didn't say it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I remember things like good times. And in bad. And sickness and in health for richer or poor, some of y'all in the poor moment, or the yeah. richer moment, or the good times, or bad times. I promise to love you. I vow to love you and only you as long as we both shall live. And didn't say anything about your feelings. Nothing about feelings, right? I mean, it's because marriage is work. That's right. It's work. You know, I look at people, I want to get married. Go on, get married. Go on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See how much fun it is. <laughs> To all my single people in the room, enjoy being single. Enjoy being enjoy single. It. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy just, you know, getting up whenever you want and going to the store and buying whatever you want and going to work. <laughs> and do it now. Just, you know, if you decide to go somewhere else, okay, yeah, let's go do that. And no. You get called. Where are you? When are yeah. you coming back? What's going on? Where are you still there? Especially if right. you're home with the kids. Oh, yeah. I mean, the kids call you. I'm calling yeah, you. You're calling We're me. We're freaking out over here. Get home. How long does it take you to go to Target? As right. long as I need. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So it is. And single doesn't mean a half a person. Single means whole. That's right. And so you want to be a whole person looking for another whole person. Well, I think a lot of single people want to get married because they're like, oh, I just have this void 
in my heart and I need, and I need my spouse to fill it. Your spouse is never going to fill that void no, ever, ever. You're going into a marriage with false like thoughts. Cause it's not going to happen. You'll be with that same void in a marriage and lonely. Yeah. Because your spouse can never feel that. And for you to put that expectancy on him is very, mm. it's just, you shouldn't do that. Talk about it. Because God is the only person that can feel this job. I'm affirming. I'm like, You're amen. doing what you say. Ooh, girl. <laughs> I am doing a good job up here. <laughs> I'm trying <Yeah>. hard. <laughs> I lose track when you say that, though. Okay. I like it when people feedback <laughs> when I'm talking, but... You also don't get married because you're sexually frustrated. Yeah. Because you will be married. That's right. And be sexually frustrated. Mm -hmm. I know no married person wants to say amen, but somebody, <laughs> act like something's in your eye. <laughs> and wink at me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's totally true. And so I love what this says in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. It says, uh, let nothing be uh, done through selfish ambition. It talks about, but with lowliness of mind, uh, let each esteem the other above himself. So preferring your spouse above yourself, let each of you uh, look out, not only for his own interest, but for the interests of others. And let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, that's what Jesus did. He, he was looking out for us. You know, he, he, he thought we were the most important. That's right. Not that he was the most important. We were the most important. Christ modeled this, who being formed, um, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, taking upon the role of a servant. Marriage is about servant. Mm -hmm. And it's about interdependence, not independence. You know, a lot of people want to be married, but they want to be independent. If you want to be independent, you should be single. Yes. Because marriage is not about independence. Marriage is about interdependence. Mm -hmm. Marriage is about us leaning on each other. Our goal when we get to the end of this is to just be one good person. Yeah. You know, like one of us got one good leg. <laughs> you know, it's two walking together. She can see, but I can reach. <laughs> you know, like two... By, by the time you get old enough, you're, together you make it work. Can I get an amen on that, right? Amen. And so to be servants for each other, not making, about, not, not making it about me, but making it about you, and Christ modeled this to us. He did, and for those that say, well, give me an example of a marriage that did this. Well, I think Christ showed us that you can be selfless and be in a relationship. You just have to choose to be like him. Yeah. And that's just killing your flesh and what you think should be right and what you think that, that that person deserves. You have to stop that and say, no, God has called me to do this and I'm going to go to him for my strength mm. and him for my forgiveness because your spouse cannot give you that. Right. They can't give you forgiveness. You're not, you're still going to have that wound. And every time they do something, it's just going to reopen and reopen and reopen. See, did until it again. It becomes, yeah. Until it becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. You have to go to God in order to get that healing. And let God plug the hole. Yes. Some people, no matter how many compliments, you look nice today. Didn't say anything about yesterday. <laughs> it's exhausting. You know what I mean? Like, get filled. Nobody can fill that. No, take the, uh, take the day as, okay, this is a new day for us. If you guys have had issues in your marriage and there's struggles, come to your spouse today and be like, let's ask each other for forgiveness and let's choose to make the rest of the day and tomorrow better. Yeah. And don't go back to, well, this is what you did in the past. Well, this is what you did back then. Because you're never, your spouse will, is never going to have the opportunity to overcome that because you're always living there. You're living in your past. So good. So good. <laughs> so we called, we decided, or I decided, I guess, I didn't run by you, but I decided to call this sermon <laughs> Making Love Long Lasting. You guys will know why. Making you Love. That. Long lasting. How many of you like that title? I think it's a good title. Come on, how many of you like that title? I knew you would. Bunch of heathens. And um, you might not remember the sermon. You remember the title, I guess. But, but uh, you know, like we we said a moment ago, divorce is. We first of all, we don't talk about divorce. No. We don't bring it up. We don't threaten each other with that. It's our kids don't hear us threaten each other. It's not an option. Not an option. For us. And divorce is breaking covenant. That's really what that is. And uh, marriage is about entering into covenant. And, you know, I know some people go, well, we went down to the courthouse and they granted me a divorce. Man can grant a divorce. Doesn't mean that God recognizes it. So just because man 
it's like man. Man can recognize marriage. We live in a world where they say two men can get married, two women can get, get married. Doesn't mean God recognizes the marriage. You remember when David killed Bathsheba's husband so he could have her? He lusted after her and killed Uriah. And then he married her after he had her husband killed. God never refers to Bathsheba as David's wife. God always calls her, even after David married her, God always called her Uriah's wife because David recognized a marriage that God refused to recognize. So just because man recognizes a marriage, it doesn't mean God will recognize it. Just because man recognizes a divorce doesn't mean that God will recognize it. And there, there are a few instances in the Bible that God does permit divorce, mm -hmm. you know, abandonment and adultery, those kind of things. But abuse, abuse those kind of things, that there, there are a few that God does permit it. Uh, but now we live in a world that if I do and don't like it, then I don't. Mm -hmm. It's all about your feelings. And that is not, that is not, a, that is not a, a divorce that God will recognize. That's what the state would call a no-fault divorce. That's the world we live in. They call it a no-fault divorce. It's, you're good, I'm good, we just don't wanna be in this anymore. You take this, I'll take that, we're good. That's called a no-fault divorce. And even though man may recognize it and the court may recognize it, God does not recognize that. And it's kinda like we wanna include God when we wanna come together, mm -hmm. but then we just want man when we wanna get out. Oh, Jesus. So true. God told me to marry him, Pastor. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. God told, God told me. If I had a dollar for every time I heard God told me. Uh, but but people say, you know, so they want they want God, and they want me there, and they want God there when we're coming together. When when they want out, they don't talk to me or God. Yeah, that's true. They talk to a judge who was not there when we did this covenant. They talk to a lawyer who was not there when we did this covenant. And so uh, you've got to realize that when, when you make a vow, God is serious about this. Mm -hmm. God said it'd be better for you to not take a vow than to take a vow and break it. And you think, well, God don't care about it. How do you, do you care if somebody vows to do something or give you something and they don't give it to you? Work for two weeks and see if they say, yeah, I'm not going to pay you. <laughs> yep. In two weeks, you'd be hot. You know what I'm saying? You'd be calling a turn in two weeks just for work. And you think God don't care about this vow you took? You think God is like, well, you know, whatever. My name's Wes. I ain't in the mess. You know, God's not, God's not like that. God takes this very seriously. So a lot of people want, they want God to, to pull it together, but then they let man pull it apart. And that's why the Bible says what God has joined together, let no man tear asunder. Right. First Corinthians chapter 11, I won't take time to read the whole chapter, but it talks about how uh, in, in the Trinity, the Father, uh, the Son submitted to the Father, the Holy Spirit submitted to um, the will of the Son, that husbands are su to submit to Christ, and that wives are supposed to submit to their husbands, and the children submit to the parents. So everybody is under authority. Covenant only works under authority. And, you know, when you came down and you said those vows, you're like, well, I don't remember what I said. I was just thinking about the honeymoon. Well, whether you realize it or not, when you walked out of that, when you left me and you walked down that aisle and you left, God walked down that aisle with you. And God became the threefold cord in that home. And the Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken. And um, a, a lot of people break that covenant. And when you break covenant, you die. I'm not talking about you die physically, but you become separated. Death means separation in the Bible. So you remember in Genesis when it said, God told him, he said, if you eat of this tree, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely. They didn't die physically, but what died? Their covenant with God died. And it became difficult. It became hard. And that's what happens, you know, if we commit adultery, we break the covenant. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 talks about when a man sleeps, if a man sleeps with a prostitute, he marries her. That, and I, I know I'm going to wreck some people with this, but sex is a marriage vow. It is. Sex is a marriage vow. That it's not about you just what you said and, and you know, just some ceremony, just, just the ceremony. A part of consummating that marriage in God's eyes is the intimacy, is the sexual moment when two become one in intimacy. Uh, that is a consummation of that marriage. And that's why you don't just go around and sleep around. I'm single and I'm just sleeping around. You got young people now talking about their body counts, and how, which is how many people they slept with. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be one, that's your right. spouse. That's right. Any sexual activity outside a heterosexual marriage, according to the Bible, is, is not God's best for your life. 
any, 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 yes. any sexual activity outside a heterosexual marriage is outside of God's best for your life. I can't get an amen, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm not ashamed to say it. You can be ashamed to say it. I'm not going to be ashamed to say it. And uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, I love this because it talks about how husbands ought to treat their wives. It says to husbands in the same way, uh, be considerate as you live with your wife and treat them and respect them as the weaker vessel, the weaker, weaker partner, um, and as heirs with you in this glorious gift of life so that your prayers do not be hindered. What God is saying in that is that if you don't treat your wife right, I don't hear you. When, God says, I will not hear you when you pray. Now, that's, that's New Testament. That's Peter. Mm-hmm. God says, if you don't treat her right, you too busy. When she comes to you with her tears, she comes to you with her concerns, her worries, and her fears, and you don't want to hear it, God says, when you come to me with your concerns... Your worries and your fears, I, I'm not going to hear it. God says, I will not, don't even, don't even pray to me. Don't even worship. I don't want to hear it. Malachi chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 talks about don't even worship. Your worship's in vain. Your prayers are in vain if you don't treat your wife right. Oh, Jesus. That's good. It's so true. Yeah. God says, I, I, am, I, am, going to, I am going to listen to you when you listen to her. And I tell you a lot, God speaks to me a lot. And a lot of times it sounds like her. I'm going to start saying, don't be mad at God. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't like it. But one of the greatest gifts you can give your spouse is permission to correct you. This is true. But the Bible also says that, I'm talking to the wives here. You're not, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible for you to correct your husbands. Oh Nowhere. It actually tells you to not nag. So... Obviously, God knew that we're naggers, and he's telling us to not nag, and it doesn't tell you to correct your husband. If there is a challenge with your husband, you got to give him to God, because let God deal with him. Because I'd rather you deal with me than God deal with me. Exactly. <laughs> it, it is, it, 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 you know, and that, that's, a real, that's a real powerful statement that you just made, and, and I, think, I think one of the greatest things I've done is give, give my wife permission to correct me and she's given me permission to correct her but I think on top of it one of the greatest gifts she's given me is praying for me you know being that ally I always tell guys whatever you're going through your wife already knows like if you're doing that she already knows yes she does she already, she, I'm telling you she's so just further ahead <laughs> than you on this and so like uh, especially if they're praying mm-hmm. because God will begin to show them sh- what, any the reason you should pray for your spouse and your children and what is because God shows you things about them and God gives you an understanding about them. And it's hard to be angry at somebody you understand. How many of you have a friend that everybody else, they get on their, their nerves, but you get them and you're like, they're normally not like that. If you knew them like I did, anybody got a friend like that? If you don't, you might be the person, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but God, you have an understanding about them, so you have this grace for them. It's, it's like that. You, maybe with your kids, you understand your kids, so you have a grace. Other people don't have that grace for them. And so that's what happens when you pray for your spouse. So Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God says, I hate divorce. And I want to talk about this just for a moment. When God says he hates divorce, he does not hate divorced people. And anybody in here who's been through a divorce or has parents who've been through divorce or kids or family members or friends, I think they'd agree with God when they say, mm-hmm. I hate it. Yep. I hate everything about it. I hate the whole situation. It, the whole thing's just terrible. I hate, I just hate the whole thing. But God doesn't hate you. And, and, and if you, you have been through a situation where God permitted divorce, I would let you know too that there is life after divorce, that God is not through with you. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. That, that, you, that, that you have the right to love again and laugh again and hope again and believe again that the best days of your life are in front of you. But we have to take time to talk about the seriousness of this covenant and the seriousness of this vow mm-hmm. and realize that even though we are of equal um, value to God, that Pastor Joanne is equal to me in every way, that, that men and women, I, I'm, I'm with you on being paid the same and every opportunity, equal, equal, equal. But we're not of equal responsibility. We're not of equal responsibility. When, when God came down in the garden after they had eaten of the tree, God didn't ask Eve anything. He came down and 
to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? That's right. And he's the one who brought up Eve. Well, the woman that thou gave us to be with me, I wouldn't be in this mess, but you're the one who gave her to me, <laughs> right? Adam brought up Eve. God said, I ain't talking about her. I, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't even need to speak to her. I'm here to speak to you. Where are you? When things go wrong in the marriage, God's coming to me. When things go wrong in the home, God's coming to me. That's right. Jonathan, where are you in this situation? Where are you in this marriage? Where are you in this family? So even though we are of, of God loves us the same and we're, we're equal in, in, in all these ways, we're not of equal responsibility. One of the things that's very interesting in this, and then I'll share this when we move on, is in Genesis uh, one, it, it refers to God as, and God said, and God said, and God said, let there be light, and God said this, and God said that. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, after he makes man, it switches from, and God said, to the Lord God said. It puts the word Lord before God, because in Genesis 1, God is, is just Elohim. It's, it's his, um, his deity name, his his, his title, you know? But once they put uh, the Lord God, it became Yahweh Elohim, and Yahweh is the relational aspect of God. It's the covenant relationship. It's his covenant name. It's his relational name. So once he made man, he's no longer just Elohim. He was Yahweh Elohim. It moved from just God said to the Lord God said. But what was interesting is when Satan came, he didn't go to Adam. He went to Eve. And when Satan went to Eve, he said, has God said unto you? He didn't say, has the Lord God said? He said, has God said unto you? See, because Satan doesn't mind you having religion as long as you don't have relationship. That's right. He doesn't mind you knowing about God as long as he's not your Lord. Oh, my God. Am I helping anybody? It's too deep. It's too deep for Sunday morning. <laughs> and so a lot, of, like, a lot of you in the room, you may be like, I know about God, but is God your Lord? Is he the Lord of your marriage? Is he the Lord of your life? Mm -hmm. and, and, or is he just, has just God said? Have you submitted? And that's where it falls apart. The whole thing fell apart because they got rid of Lord and they bypassed Adam. And the whole thing would have turned out different if Adam would have stepped up and said, what are you doing talking to my wife? That's right. I want to tell you something. But, but the man became passive. She starts handing him something to eat. You see, the man is the giver. Men are givers, women are receivers. Whatever you give a woman, she takes it, multiplies it, gives it back to you. You, I give my woman a house, she gives me a home. I give her seed, she gives me children. I give her hell, she gives me damnation. <laughs> so if you don't like what you're getting from her, check what you're giving to her, because what you're getting from her is a direct derivative of what you're giving to her. And so the roles got reversed he becomes the taker, she becomes the giver, she becomes the talker, he becomes silent, and within six chapters, they've lost the garden, sin has entered the world, and their kids are killing each other. Literally. Mm -hmm. Because our roles got reversed. And I'm not talking about women can't, shouldn't have equal jobs, should equal pay, I'm with you on all that. Be whatever you wanna be, do whatever you wanna do. I'm talking about within the home. Within the home, I'm talking about within the context of your marriage, within your family. I'm not talking about it, some company you work for. I'm talking about in this home, there has to be a head. There has to be the husband. And God told husbands to love their wives like Christ loved the church. And Christ died butt naked in the hot sun for the church. Come on, somebody. I count myself like Paul. I have not yet obtained. That's right. He set the bar pretty high. So you got to be careful walking around talking about, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man, because if it all goes south. Well, Christ in control. You're the man. I, mean, I think that that's the big thing is control. Like women don't want to be controlled, but Christ in control, you know. His, free will. His, yeah, his, you have free will. I think a husband should just treat his wife the way Christ loves the church, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to love her. 
If you love her, that woman is going to do anything for you. And especially if you're a man after so God's good. heart. If you're a man after God's heart and you love your wife, I'm telling you, you're going to have a different person living we, with you. We have never seen a wife that would not submit to her husband. Because the Bible didn't call women to submit to men. No. It says let every wife submit to her own husband. And submission is a combination of two words, sub and mission. I mean, he has a mission. You come under the mission to help him meet the mission. And you can't help him meet, him meet the mission if he doesn't have a mission. That's right. So before you get in a dating relationship, where are we going? I'm going to die, and I don't know when I'm going to die. And every moment I waste with you is a moment I'm never going to have again. Would you please pull over and ask somebody where we are going? You know? <laughs> There's nothing more frustrating in the world than following somebody who doesn't know where they're going. Yes. For all of our singles in the room, be very selective Ooh, on who selective. you pick as your spouse. Don't do it out of, oh, I'm so lonely. Don't do it out of that. Do it as, I know that this is the person for me. I know that God has brought this man to be in my life. Right. And God showed you in a dream and a vision. So you don't, have to, you don't have to date everybody because God has shown you. You don't have to operate in feelings because you have a dream and a vision. God's first language is not English. God's first language is visions and dreams. So if you're single, you need to ask God, show me in a dream or a vision, my husband or my wife, what they're doing so that when I meet them, I go, that's you. That's God right. showed me that's you right. and I don't have to date everybody for five, seven years trying to feel my way through. You feel when you can't see. You, if the lights got turned off right now and I told you to get out of here, you'd have to feel your way out. But because you can see, you can walk faster. And the reason he won't marry you is because he can't see, so he's feeling, and you're feeling, and that's why y'all dating for five, seven, eight years trying to feel because you can't see. But if you could see, you could make the decision to move forward. Somebody say amen. Amen. And everything in, the, everything in a covenant, everything in your marriage revolves around your covenant. Your, co your covenant is like the football in the, the ball in the football game. Where is it on the yard line? Is, did it make, did it cross the, uh, to go into the, the uh, end zone? D did it go in between the field goal post? Everything about that game is, is in reference to the position of the ball. Everything in your marriage is in reference and position to where your covenant is. You made a covenant uh, between God and you made a covenant with your spouse. And, um, and that's the thing you've got you've to begin to realize. And I'm going to leave you with this last part before we go on. Is biblical love is not an emotion. That's right. It's a decision. <laughs> biblical love is not an emotion. It's a, God chose to love you. You didn't treat him right. Mm -hmm. I didn't treat him right. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. He got a bad deal with me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you right now, God got a bad deal with me. I haven't loved him like I should have loved him all my life. I didn't do what he, I don't know about you. Some of y'all quiet acting like you're so super spiritual. But I can tell you, he didn't get a good deal with me. For what he went through for me, yep. he didn't get a good deal with me. I, I owe him the praise. Come on, I owe him the worship. He didn't get some great deal with me. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, uh, and so choosing to love my wife is a decision. It's not always a feeling. Sometimes you're going to feel it. Sometimes you're not. But you can't make decisions based on your feelings. You're not going to survive on it. You got to choose it whether they deserve it or not. I think I hear a lot of that. Well, he doesn't deserve this and he doesn't deserve me to act like that. He doesn't. Does he? No. But does God call you to, to be a wife to him? Yes. So you're either going to show him what God says and let your actions win him, or you're going to just go down this crazy cycle with your spouse of, well, you did this, well, I'm going to do this, well, you did this, well, I'm going to do this. You're never going to get out of that. You're never going to get out of this whole tit for tat. Yeah. You're going to have to, one of y'all is going to have to like, okay, we got to come back to the drawing table and like, we got to go to God and we have to get God in this to heal this. Obviously, there's some things about you that annoy me, but I have to go to God for that because you're not going to change. The Lord has to change you because I can't. I can yeah. only change myself. And sometimes you got to listen to what your spouse is saying because a lot of people don't want to, you don't want to look inwards. You don't ever want to look like, oh, maybe I am doing that. But sometimes some things that your spouse is complaining about you is things that you do need to change. It's true, yeah. And so start looking at yourself like maybe I need to be doing this. Maybe, oh, yeah, I do do that. Oh, yeah, I do do that. Like, you have to, like, 
become aware of what you do do so that you can change. And in your changing, you're, I mean, you're walking in faith that he's going to change or she's going to change because you have to do what God has called you to do. God did not tell you to change your spouse. Like whatever you do or say is not going to change them. Yelling, screaming, kicking, hitting, I mean, making a scene. Throwing furniture around the room. It's not going to change. You're still going to be living in the same thing. So you've got to come back. You've got to take yourself out of that scenario and think about it. What would I say to someone else if they came to me with my situation? So good. That's exactly right. Your spouse is going to do things that get on your nerves. They're going to annoy you. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're gonna do those kind of things. I mean, dating advertises a product that marriage doesn't deliver. You don't meet your spouse until you marry them. That's right. I never dated her. I dated girlfriend Joanne. I dated her. I didn't meet wife Joanne till the next day. <laughs> and she took my girlfriend <laughs> behind a building and shot her. <laughs> I have not seen her in 17 years. <laughs> And I was only married to wife Joanne for a year before mom Joanne <laughs> killed wife Joanne. <laughs> and I haven't seen her in 16 years. <laughs> and now I am married to wife Joanne. Mom. And mom, mom and vice versa. Husband. Now I get her out. I, I see glimpses mm-hmm. of girlfriends. There's, There's glimpses. <laughs> I get her away from them kids long enough. I can, there's, I, I see the ghost of girlfriend. Yeah. I'm out. Okay, but your, your spouse, ghosts. I'm just kidding. We don't believe in ghosts. I'm not endorsing ghosts, my Lord. But, um, you gotta say that. I know, I gotta say everything now. Uh, but I'm just saying that uh, dating can advertise a product that marriage doesn't deliver. And, uh, you, you have to realize that there's going to be times that your spouse frustrates you. There's going to be times that your, your spouse gets on your nerves. And you have to manage your expectations. It's like when we go out of town. We go out of town and we go somewhere without the kids. I'm thinking, we're going to have all this amazing sex. She's going to wear this. It's going to be amazing. My girlfriend's going to come back. I'm, I'm, I'm putting in, like, all this sexy underwear in this suitcase for her. She's packing, like, pillows. and ma- She's thinking, I'm going to sleep. And I'm thinking, if you want to sleep, we could have just stayed at home <laughs> and sleep. Now we get out there, and, and she just wants to sleep. Now I'm hot mad, <laughs> right? Because I'm like, oh, we're supposed to be doing all this stuff, and now you just want to sleep. And, and I'm having now manage my disappointment because I didn't manage my expectations. And I think with your spouse, you need to talk about expectations. And if you don't manage your expectations, you will find yourself managing your disappointments. And so you have to think, okay, out of this trip, this is what you want. This is what I want. This is what we're going to do. And try to really focus on meeting each other's needs right. and be a servant lover, be a servant to each other. I mean, just all kinds of things. I mean, people are going to, people are just people. And, and you, you, we, we watch people go out on their date and what's your favorite color and what's your favorite ice cream? What difference does it make? I can buy my own ice cream. Because it's going to change too. You change flavors of ice cream. That yeah, everything like. changes. Talk about life. Exactly. Talk about, see, people don't divorce over vision. They divorce over values. Vision is what we want to do. Values are how we want to do it. Oh, you want to be successful? I want to be successful. Same vision. Let's get married. But to me, success is working 90 hours a week. To you, it was working 20. Oh, I want to have kids. She wants to have kids. Same vision. Let's get married. No, because how we want to do kids is different. See, you want to talk about the the values. The values are the rudder of the boat. It's not, it's not what we want to do. It's how we want to do it. It's like churches. Why are all these churches all over the Twin Cities? It's not because we all don't love God. It's because we don't agree on how we're going to serve the Lord. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that, even when you look for a church, what you're looking at is not the vision. You're looking at the values. What, it's, the values are the how we do it. Does that make sense to you? That's right. I mean, people are going to, there's going to be things that happen. And I, I, I do things going to her nerve all the time. I mean, I get in trouble all the time doing things you know i used to if i i i used to find out she still still if she gets mad enough she'll she'll go to cleaning if i'm really mad at if you. i come in the house <laughs> and she's cleaning <laughs> oh my god he knows he did something wrong something is wrong so if the house gets too dirty <laughs> time to do something stupid 
I think, you know, we are in prayer and fasting right now. I feel like if, for me, I'm talking about for me, if my kids get on my nerves, everything he does gets on my nerves. For a couple days, I'm like, I have to like check myself. Wait a minute, I didn't spend any time with God today. Like, that's why all y'all are getting on my nerves. And I have to say, I'm sorry. I have to go apologize and say, I'm sorry. I didn't spend any time with the Lord this week or this day or these couple days. Please forgive me. I'm in a bad mood. Everybody come pray for me. And so to have an understanding, like it's not always, you have to go to God for strength in order to handle your daily life. Mm. Because if not, everybody's going to get on your nerves. Yeah. From that. And then just learn to be honest with your spouse. And she'll come to me, why can't you change the toilet paper holder? My God, how old do you have to be (laughs) to put this on here? Or to pick up your clothes off the floor. Or pick up your clothes. Did your mother not teach you? Do you not know how to do it? And you just have, we just, you know, then I would point out, and perhaps I'd point out something she did, and she'd point out something I did, and now we go down the crazy cycle. Now I just go, I don't know why I can't change the toilet paper holder. I think I'm too lazy to get up and walk all the way into the utility room and get a roll, and if I leave just a little bit on there, it becomes somebody else's problem. I don't know. I have a problem. Please pray for me. And I go to her and I say, please pray. <laughs> She's got this thing now that she puts in front of the toilet called a, Why you gotta put all a my squatty business out potty. There? And it's this piece of furniture. He busted me out. That you put, all, she puts it in front of the toilet and you're supposed to sit on it, like makes your legs go up so you can use the bathroom easier. <laughs> and I'm like, why are we using this thing? I got on it once. I felt like a <laughs> gargoyle on top of a building <laughs> perched on this thing. And I'm like, why are we using this thing? I almost <laughs> broke my neck. I'm getting up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and I'm falling over this piece of furniture. You're complaining about me peeing on the seat. You're putting furniture in front of the toilet. <laughs> Is not furniture. <laughs> See, this is where you just stay quiet because I could say something else to bust him out, but I'm not going I almost to. broke my neck. <laughs> Pastor can't preach Sunday. He fell on the squatty <laughs> potty, broke his arm. We're putting together a prayer team. <laughs> See it now. So, so marriage is marriage is 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 different. How we, I see it is different from how she sees it, and you have to watch out for uh, bitterness and resentment. And it comes up, I think, many times when one person begins to feel like they're being treated unfairly in the marriage, or they're taking on more responsibility. Bitterness and resentment begins to build, and the weight falls when one person feels like they're taking on more instead of both. And what happens is people start keeping score. Mm-hmm. They start keeping score with it. And, and it's been said that men and women keep score differently. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. So, for men, I don't know if I should tell you about our organization, but for, for men, our organization, the very fact that we, we got out the bed, <laughs> put our pants on, got dressed, and left the house, that's a 1,000 points. <laughs> we got up today, got dressed, and we're bringing home a paycheck. That's another thousand points. And You're we didn't. To be doing we didn't uh, run after any women. We didn't pursue some women, woman or anything. That's at least five thousand points. That's so a covenant. Seven thousand points. I'm just saying. That's, that's not how like a we benefit. think. That's a covenant. So by the time we get home, we've got like ten thousand points. <laughs> so we give ourselves permission to sit on the couch, so you can catch up. We're like she. You know, I'm so far ahead, I should probably sit down so she can catch up. What have you done all day here? What have you been doing all day? You know? Yeah. That's how men think. Yes. Okay? And. So true. I used to think that, you know, with her until I watched the kids. I'm like, what did you, the, the house is a disaster until I watched the kids. And if you can keep them alive. I'm not talking about fed or clothed. I'm talking about alive. You won. Let me, let me give the husbands a, a word of advice. Please don't ever ask your wife, what does she do today? Yeah. Or what are you going to do today? What are you doing? What did you, or what did you do? Yeah, or what did you do today? Don't, just, 
Just take that question out of your mind and your you thought process. Because it's not going to be good. <laughs> so, but women see it different. I've learned that women see it like you got up, you know, as a guy, you got up, you got dressed, you went out. That's one point. And you shouldn't even get that point. You, you brought home a paycheck. That's one more point. You didn't chase women. You get to live. Yeah. That's one point. That's no points. I'm just telling you. <laughs> it doesn't work with you correcting me while I'm up here doing this. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, they see like you got three points. And, uh, you know, men want, want you to like, they, they think, we think that if like we can do big things, like we got to do these big things because the bigger it is, the more points we get. For us, it's all about like trying to keep score because that's how we grew up. Like always, that's why when men slept, you know, if they slept around, they said, oh, you know, they called it scoring. You know, because it was all about points for us, all about affirmation for us. It was all about those kind of things. So we're trying to get the points. That's why when your wife, you know, when Pastor Joanne was the vice president of a lobbying firm and she would come and talk, start talking about all the challenges she was going through, I'd say, what you need to do is you need to go down there, you need to tell them. She said, I don't need you to tell me what to do. Well, why'd you bring it up in the first place? Because <laughs> in my mind, when, and for, I just think I speak for most men, when our wife comes to us with a problem, we want to impress her by fixing it. So we begin to tell her what she needs to do because somehow in our mind, we think like you're gonna be like, you're so smart, so amazing, and then run into the bedroom, put on this like sexy outfit and come out and be like, oh my God, you're so wise. Like that's what we think is gonna happen. And it doesn't happen. And so we like, we wanna impress you by saying this. And what I've learned is just non-appropriate places. Tell her you are more than qualified to handle this on your own. If you need me, I'm here for you. And learn that sometimes she just needs to talk. That's how a lot of affairs start for women is they just found somebody. They, they would say, I don't know. I just felt like I could talk to him. Regardless of why he was talking or why he was listening, he was listening. That's right. And that's why one of the, one of the five needs for a woman, I don't want to get into that whole talk today. That's another sermon we've done. But is, is um, letting your, your spouse speak to you. And, letting, and just listening, I think, is a big need for your wife. And paying attention. And paying attention, like looking at them. No phones. And, and not, don't fall asleep. <laughs> Stay awake. And what helps, guys, is, is if you want to get, start to get the bell ringing more, is like I learned when she's talking like that, is just like, I'll, I'll give you a couple things right down. Say, like, say things like, uh, what? No, she didn't. Girl knows better than that. Girl, please. And I just say those like different times. What? No, she didn't. Girl, please. Girl knows better than that. You got to be kidding. And I just, you just throw those in. The bell is You want to start making more points? Get up, you know. When she goes, make the bed. She goes to brush your teeth, make the bed in the morning. Hey, do you know how to make the bed? I'm, I've seen it done. <laughs> um, the, the dishes, put the dishes in the box, that thing there. Put, put them in that thing. You don't even know how to work? I'm going to learn how to work it. <laughs> if I'm going to preach sermons like this, i got to learn how to work it. Uh, or pick up your clothes. Anything like that. Anything you can do to get the bell to ring. It, that's what you want. Ladies, for us, it's so much easier. All you got to do to make the bell, there's one thing we want to make the bell ring. <laughs> it's the title of the sermon. <laughs> so it doesn't take a whole lot. And for men, it's been said that men are like um, microwaves when it comes to intimacy. And women are like crock pots. <laughs> so it doesn't take long at all for men. Men were like, okay, let's go. We're ready. Women, it's like, you got to plug it in <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> you got you to gotta check on it all day. All day you got to check on that thing. And then at night, maybe. Maybe it's hot. 
if one of the kids don't unplug it, <laughs> knock it off the counter. Because those kids will destroy it. Because KIDS stands for keeping intimacy at a distance successfully. That's what KIDS stands for. <laughs> and they'll knock the crock pot off. They've done it before. Don't look at me. I know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> they'll unplug it. So you got to check on it all the time. And, and, and that's how it is a lot of times with intimacy. And learn, I would say it this way, your wife has to be your standard of beauty. Mm-hmm. Your wife is your standard of beauty. No matter what age, when my wife was 20, I was into 20. When she's 30, I was into 30. Now she's 40. She's 40. I'm into 40. And I read recently that women sexually peak at 40. So this is my year. I've claimed this is my year as a prophetic word. When I read it, I showed her. I said, this is a prophetic word. Most 40-year-olds for don't our have marriage. twin one-year-olds. It's still a prophetic word. Don't try and take my, my, my word away. This is a prophetic word. And, um, and no matter what, you know, but those kids will. Those kids, they're like, you know, they're little terrorists. All they understand is force. And you got to, like, I deal with them. And I'm like, you got to go to bed now. <laughs> well, we want mommy. Everybody wants mommy. You ain't the only one that wants mommy. Everybody wants mommy. <laughs> you going to bed. You going to bed. And you got to get them to bed. <laughs> You know, and they'll do everything to ruin it. You know, you're trying to have intimacy. They're banging on the door, putting their fingers under the door. You're just putting it I think all they get together there. and decide we can't have any more. There's not enough toys <laughs> to go around. We have to stop this. You distract them from noon to six. We'll take the night shift. I think eight is enough. But turn, you know, you got to affirm your wife. Let her know how beautiful she is, how much you love her. No matter what, if, you're, if your spouse is tall, you're into tall. If your spouse is short, you're into short. If your spouse is skinny, you're into skinny. If your spouse puts on weight, you're into formerly skinny. <laughs> but whatever it is, that's what your spouse is into. No matter with kids, if they get stretch marks, tell them they ain't stretch marks. I say, girl, them, they tiger stripes. <laughs> Tiger strike. <laughs> Tiger strike. I saw 40 year olds flirt. Tiger strike. I know, I know some of y'all got some tiger strike. <laughs> and just learn to don't turn the lights off, turn the lights on. You know, and create those intimate moments. She'll be like, if you want me to wear that, you go get it. And I'm like, I don't want to get it, because now I'm out there in the store. Now I feel like a pervert just being in that store. <laughs> I feel like a complete pervert, and I'm always good. And then somebody's like, hey, pastor. And I'm like, oh, God, I got to get out of here, run. You know, it's like, that's the last thing I need is to be in that store. <laughs> I'll just give her an empty box, wrap it up real nice, put some tissue in it. She'll unbox it, pull the tissue off. She said, there's nothing in here. I say, exactly, put that on when I get home. <laughs> and that's how we do it. <laughs> Woo, God, oh, God, oh, oh. Lord. Feel the Holy Ghost. My God, somebody run. Y'all need to pray for your pastor. But you got to learn to have love and intimacy and fun and laughter and all of that in your home. And I think it makes people, I think it makes our kids' world feel safe when they know mom and dad love each other. Even though our son walked out for a service. Yeah, he's like, I couldn't take it. I start talking about silk sheets. Or something. Oh, we have silk sheets in our bed because I can spin on them. I can't the one. I can't move. But the silk, I can move. I'm like a cheetah in there. I, you know. He walked out. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but it makes their world feel safe when they know we love each other. You know, all of our kids are watching too. I know. I can't help it. <laughs> they have to learn somehow. I think besides, okay, can we move on from the sex? Yeah, whatever you want to talk okay, about. Besides sex, I also think that a um, um, husband loves for their wife to uh, respect them mm. and to value them. I think we have a hard time. We're quick with our um, disappointments, but we're not generous with our affirmations. Mm. And I know I'm number one in that. I can say I'm not good at that either, but we have to learn how to be better at that. Because they need that. Or your husband needs that. And that's what gets you points, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, 
we'll kill ourselves trying to, we'll hurt ourselves just trying to run after verbal praise, you know, from our, that's how a lot of affairs start for men is somebody else starts affirming your husband more than you do. Yeah. And, um, or somebody else starts, you know, I, I say this in the right context, but praising him more than you do or affirming him more than you do. And it's just like little boys, you know, when we're little, we bring the picture to mama and we colored and, oh, it's so amazing, you're so wonderful. And it's just, it's the same attitude. Wherever the noise is, that's where the attention goes. Yeah. And so I always tell people, you want to make sure that you're making those deposits. And you want to make sure you're, you're, ha you're having those talks about intimacy with your spouse. You know, like where are we on, on, on a sense of satiety? Where are we with this? Uh, because you want your spouse, you want your husband, I tell people, so full sexually that when he walks out of the house, he's like, I don't even want to look at anybody. You know, it's like if you go eat and you're so full and somebody shows you food, you're like, I can't even look at food. I'm so full. That's how, that's how you want, because uh, you don't want, you do want him to, when he thinks about intimacy, to think about you. You, you sometimes you have to give him redeemed images. Men are bombarded yeah. with sexual images all day. There's this term called sex cells. Anybody ever heard that term? Sex cells. So you've got to give him redeemed images. I tell women that. Give him redeemed images. Give him something. And if you want him, well, I, I, had, I want him to worship more. I want him to be more into God. I want him to worship more. Well, if you want him to worship on Sunday, give him something, give him something to be thankful on Saturday night. <laughs> That's what I got to say about it. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of praise going on in this room either when I got in here. It's hard when you say for, for men to be sexually frustrated to praise the Lord. It's hard. If you want them to worship, give them something to be thankful for. That's how I see it. Praise God. <laughs> Tell the truth and shame the devil. <laughs> Proverbs 632, it says that only it's, you're really an utter fool to commit adultery um, because you really destroy your soul. And in our 20 years of pastoring, anyone who has ever committed adultery, have, all of them have lived to regret it. That's right. They've all lived to regret it. And, you know, Solomon said just to have the wife of my youth and to be able to go back there. And sometimes, you know, you, you have to learn to just be honest and transparent and talk about it. Don't give each other the silent treatment. You know, some of, some of you are just pros at the silent treatment, at ignoring your grandmama did it, mama did it, you did it, or, or even men where you give each other the silent treatment. And so you can be in a house. And walking through your house, and it's like now you're treating each other like strangers, you know? And you got to go through the hallway, and you're trying to carry something, you know? It's not like you live in a mansion. There's one hallway now. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, you're going through. Sorry. You know? Or it's like <laughs> you're watching something. It's like, oh, ma'am, are you watching this? I was going to change it. If you're not. It's like, this is your wife. This is not a stranger. I was telling him uh, the other week that movie, um, Sixth Sense, where this guy... Uh, he dies, and you don't know that he's that he's dead, and it's just like he's he's with his wife in the house and everything in this movie, and at the end you go, oh my gosh, he's dead, and it just didn't dawn on us for two hours. We're just like, yeah, this is. It made more sense to us that his wife was ignoring him for two hours. <laughs> That's sad. Than to think that he's dead. It's like, yeah, I get it. This is a this is a movie about marriage. You know, I get it. This is totally. I know what he's going through. You know, it's like because we have this silent treatment thing that we do in our homes and we need to break that. It's manipulation. It's manipulation. It's a spirit of witchcraft. We've got to get it out of our homes. We cannot do it. We've got to be open and honest and transparent with our spouse. And if, if you have to talk about intimacy, if you have to talk about it, uh, talk about finances, whatever you have to discuss, say, let's talk about it. Or what we, we plan a fight. Mm-hmm. If we got to fight, let's plan a fight. That's right. Well, okay. Tomorrow night, five o'clock, we're going to fight. Now we say the we say the word fight it means we're going to discuss it. But what happens is when you both get angry, really quick in a marriage, one person can tend to talk over the other. They they're really quick with their words, and the other one's not as quick. So what happens is that one begins to be very domineering, and the other one just pulls away. And then you regret you regret what you said because yeah. you're just mad. So it gives you a time to just like walk away from each other and we're going to come back and talk about this when we're yeah. both like calm down. And that other person can have time to put their words together mm -hmm. and say, this is how I'm really feeling about it. This is how, 
This is what I wanted to express or I wanted, or I wanted to communicate. But when you just go into it, just because you feel like you won the argument, you may have hurt your spouse in a lot of really negative ways. And I'm sorry is not always a good band-aid. No, it's not. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10. Oh, you ahead read that one. She says, I am my beloved and his desire for me. His desire is for me. His desire is for me. That, that's what it's got to be. Your, your desire has to be for your spouse. Yeah, I think the world we live in is so sexually driven that you have to be very careful what you allow into your home. Movies, shows, porn. Like you gotta, you got to be gatekeepers for your home because you cannot compete against that. Those are actresses. And you cannot compete against that as a wife. So you have to be very careful what you allow in your home so that your husband sees you mm -hmm. as the person that he desires, not something else. Come on, that's so good. So good. And a lot of people, um, I would say, well, there was a study done on people who are married 30, 40 plus years, and they said, what is one of the secrets? And this is what they said. They said it was because they were generous in their explanations as to why their mate was not doing what they expected. I love that statement. They were generous in their explanation. So what happens is when she doesn't do what I want her to do, I start going, oh, she never does this, she never does that. Oh, she gets on my nerves, told her a million times. She's never gonna change, she never, right? So I'm not generous. Mm -hmm. But when you were dating them, and everybody told you, first of all, not to marry them. <laughs> Don't marry that person. What is wrong with you? Or they told you, you all you did was defend them and you were generous. Oh, you don't know them. Oh, this, oh but they're good at that. Oh, they're you good don't at that. Understand. Oh, oh, you don't understand. You were generous, 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 <clears throat> generous with your explanation. Why doesn't he come to church with you? Oh, because he, you were generous with your explanation. Well, how come y'all don't pray together? Oh, I'm generous with the explanation. How come he doesn't have a job? Oh, I'm generous with the explanation. Oh, well, why is she, why is she doing that? Why does she have all these nude pictures of her on Instagram, son? Oh, she's, she's the, you were gen, you're generous, 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 generous in your explanation. Now that you married them, you're selfish. Yep. In your explanation. You have to go back to being generous in your explanation as to why your spouse doesn't do everything you want them to do and bring healing. First Peter said, if a woman is married to a man who does not know the Lord, that she may win him through her actions, not words. First Peter said that. And so I've got to start praying in faith for my wife. She's got to start praying in faith for her husband. Faith is the substance of things we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. So I'm hoping for my husband. I'm hoping for my wife. Although I can't see it, I've got to use hope to do it. And so I want to encourage all of you, be more generous in your explanation towards your husband or your wife. Philippians 2 and 4 says, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And that's what Christ did. Christ came to show us how to do marriage. That's right. We're sinning. We're, we're, we're not living right. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He never pulled the God card to be like, I'm important, you're not. Look at me. No, he came and served us. He washed feet. He died for us. Joanne would say it. Um, well, she said it like this in the last service. You were talking about how your spouse should be the most important person to you in the room. Yeah, when your spouse walks into a room, you should like not stop what you're doing, but acknowledge that they're there. And you should value the fact that your spouse is in the room. Like when we're somewhere, I'm always going to be watching to make sure he's okay. I'm looking at him. I'm standing by him. I'm making sure he's okay. Does he need anything? Like you have to, you have to treat your spouse as if you value them in that way. Like just think of the most important person in your life who you think that you would like, you know, go crazy over to meet. Michael Jordan. Yeah, so you got to treat me like Michael Jordan was yeah. in the room. You know, so you have to do that because if you show value to your spouse, they, it just makes them feel loved just because you value your time with them, you value them being in your presence. It's not like a burden to be in your presence. It's like, oh, I, you know, you're here. Okay, thank you. Like, I acknowledge you. Like when he walks into the house after being gone all day, and we all stop what we're doing to acknowledge the fact that daddy's home. You know, and so you have to show that value to your spouse so they feel loved. And yeah, so good. It's like, 
It's like a wedding. You, you can come play something soft for me on the keys, but it's, it's like a wedding. Uh, at, at a wedding, you're not the most important person in the room. Like when you walk down the aisle, nobody stopped and looked. Nobody turned around. But when the bride mm-hmm. stood at the door, all the music stopped. Everybody stood up, turned around, and looked at her. And everybody knew she was the most important person in the room. That's how you need to acknowledge your spouse when they walk in a room. Yes. That's the level of honor. That's the level of respect. That's the level of like, you took my breath away moment because you're in the room. You're the most important person to me. You're the, I'm not going to talk over you. I'm not, I'm not going to belittle you. I'm not going to get in front of you. You're the most important person in this room. And if we would treat our spouse like that, if we would be servant lovers, you know, I'll leave you with this. Um, you know, it talks about Boaz and how Ruth met Boaz. And just to all my single people, I'm gonna, I guess I'll leave speaking to you. Uh, she waited for her Boaz, That's right. Ruth. She didn't just marry anybody. She didn't just want anybody. She was selective. She was selective. My God, be selective. Like, the Bible says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and take unto him a wife. It never talks about her leaving. It talks about him leaving. Her dad taught me that. He said, it doesn't say anything about her leaving us. It talks about you leaving your family. And I went back and read, and it's true. It says, for this cause shall man leave his father and mother. So the, so the, the son leaves to build. The wife doesn't leave to nothing. She leaves to come into what he built. And it says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, take on a wife, and they, the two shall become one flesh. So when some guy eventually one day asks for our daughter's hand in marriage, Pastor Dran and I are going to sit him down and say, you need to write a letter, an explicit detail. That's right. Explaining why she would be better off with you than us. Mm -hmm. Because I can provide a lot, a lot of love, a lot of roses, a lot of things. You need to prove to her mother and I, why is she better off with you than us? And be willing to wait on God to send the right person. Yes. Because when she met Boaz, Boaz was handsome. He was, he was uh, wealthy. He was, he was a spiritual man. He was a rich man. He was a handsome man. He was a sensitive man, which made him a great husband. Come on. <laughs> and if you wait on your Boaz... <clears throat> God will send the right man. He'll send the right woman in your life. And, and, and that way you can be okay with being in church and the fact that I wasn't at the club last night. Well, I got to find it. I got to find it. God's not bringing them. I got to find them. I got to find them. No, wait on the Lord. Yes. Wait on the Lord to send you the right person. Just wait on God. If anybody here who has ever married the wrong person or you went through a divorce, you will tell them, wait on the right person. Mm -hmm. Wait on the right person. So instead of you being a half a person, asking God to send you another half a person, you can be a whole you knowing God, being in God's house, waiting on God to send the right person. Because if you don't, Boaz has some relatives. And if you're not careful, you end up marrying one of his relatives. I'll tell him who they are. So Boaz has some relatives, (laughs) broke ass, poe as, lying as, cheating as, dumb as, drunk as, cheap as, locked up as, good for nothing as, lazy as, and his third cousin beating your ass, and wait on your bow ass so he'll respect your ass. Somebody say amen about it. Come on, you get something out of that today? Hey, everybody. Hey, guys. We just hope that you enjoyed today's talk. And I just had a blast um, just sharing about uh, love and relationship and marriage with my amazing wife, Joanne. Thank you to all of you who continue to support the ministry uh, through giving on all our platforms. We just can't tell you 
how thankful we are. If this touched your heart, if it touched your life, please share it uh, on your social media platform. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, you are in our prayers. We love you. Let's continue to do what God's called us to do in our marriages. Let's bless and heal our spouse with our words because of what God's joined together. Let no man tear asunder. We love you. God bless.